are back as we go through our study of the book of Matthew. Um, before we get started, let's just go to, to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do come to you tonight, God, and ask for your presence to be here. And we ask that you give us insight, Lord. And Father, we do want to pray for those that are enduring this hurricane right now, God. And we ask for your protection, Lord. And uh, Father, we, um, we know that the enemy is the prince of the power of the air, Lord. And so uh, um, I just pray for uh, safety and uh, Lord, that you would just keep the floodwaters from uh, overtaking um, the cities and taking lives, Lord. And Father, um, that in this, Lord, people would seek you out. Father, we just ask for a blessing now in our time together. We ask this humbly in Jesus' name, and all the church said, amen. 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 So <clears throat> we are in Matthew chapter 3, and uh, we were introduced last week to John the Baptist. And so I just want to go back and kind of recap the first six verses so we can kind of get a feel for where we're going to be at tonight. And, um, and I want to talk a little bit more about uh, John the Baptist uh, being in the... Uh, for lack of a better word, the image of, of Elijah. So if you'd open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, I'm reading out of the NIV tonight, so if you want to switch to the, switch the NIV on your Bible app, if that's what you have, it reads, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. And people went out to meet him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him <clears throat> in the river Jordan. And so we see John the Baptist introduced in the person. The first time we here of John the Baptist is actually when he is in his mother's womb and Mary shows up and she has this encounter with her cousin. And John the Baptist immediately recognizes Christ in Mary's womb and it leap, he leaps for joy. Now we have the person of John. And <clears throat> John is a type of Elijah. And he is also going to redo, he's going to redo history as being John the Baptist. Now, as we get started, I want to look at seven parallels with Elijah and John the Baptist to help identify John as truly this person who was prophesied to come in the, let's say, image of Elijah, in the authority of Elijah, I should say, and, uh, and do the work that he was called to do. So the first thing I want to look at is that they were both they both preached repentance when Israel had turned from God. Now, Elijah, when he comes on the scene as a prophet, the nation of Israel has already fallen into idolatry, and they have moved farther and farther away from God. And so Elijah is going to call out to the people, and he's going to basically tell them, look, you need to make a choice. If you go to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, it reads, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? I, 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 it just looks like people today. People are so confused. Do, do, I, do I lean this way or do I lean that way? Do I, do I choose to follow God or do I choose to follow this? He says, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. So Elijah's call was to bring the nation of Israel to repentance. If you look at the first two verses we just read in, John, in Matthew chapter 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So John the Baptist's message was the same. It was to repent, turn away from what you've been doing, turn away from the lifestyle that you've been doing. And God is calling us to do the same thing today, church. He's calling us to make a choice. Are we going to choose him or are we going to choose the things of the world? Church, I'm telling you right now, the persecution is coming in the United States. 
This cushy nonsense that the church has been preaching, I think, is a, pit, a lot from the pit of hell. I believe we're going to feel the sting of things. We're already starting to feel it. We're already starting to be pinpointed. Why is the United States, right, why is it protected differently than a lot of these other people, or should I say Christians in the United States protected differently than Christians in other countries? Church, it's coming. We've got to be ready, man. Choose whom you will serve. The second similarity or the second uh, identity that John is in the authority of Elijah, it's their, their appearance was the same. They had the same look, the same appearance. Elijah and John could be identified even from a distance. Why? Because of their wardrobe, because of what they wore. Most people in that time, they wore robes of some type of cloth. Not many wore animal hair, animal skins. And these two messengers, they didn't comply with the structures of conformity. They wore what they wore. They were very identifiable. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 7 says this, The king asked them, What kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this? And they replied, He had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. And the king said, that was Elijah the Tishbite. Very identifiable. Matthew chapter 3, verse 4, we just read it. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. Same identical garb. No difference between the two men. Why? Because John the Baptist needed to be identified as the Elijah who was going to come and proclaim the Messiah. The third similarity between the two they were both fed from the wildlife of the desert god provided them food in unusual ways the desert grocery store was not wasn't nearby right there wasn't the fast food restaurant for a goat burger or a fig salad or anything like that right they were supernaturally provided for remember elijah jezebel tells him that she's going to kill him and we're going to look at this in a little bit so Elijah flees. Where does he go? He goes into the wilderness. He goes up on a mountain. And while he is there, God supernaturally feeds him through ravens who bring him food. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here. Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook. And I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Can you imagine birds bringing you food for sustenance? This is how powerful our God is. He can control everything, every situation. He can speak anything into your life. If it's a provision that you need, God will supply it. He promises it. And he will supply it in the most supernatural ways, church says in Matthew chapter 3, the second part of verse 4, it says, uh, and his food was locusts and wild honey, right? John partook of the available resources where he dwelled in the wilderness. So he was eating wild locusts, and, or he was eating locusts and the wild honey. I wonder what, why, what's the difference between honey and wild honey? I don't know. I mean, I guess because it's, I don't know. Is I guess so. <laughs> That was a good one. Number four, they were both, excuse me, they both were separated from the false religions of their day. This is huge, church. Elijah and John recognized the hypocrisy of the nation and its religious leaders. Elijah came out against the kings who refused to do as God's way. In fact, he came out super hard against Ahab who had gone way too far by marrying Jezebel, who was a Phoenician who brought the Baal worship to Israel. And then she supported it. 2 Kings verse 116. He told the king, this is Elijah, this is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel for you to consult that you have sent messengers to consult Baal Zebub? the God of Ekron, because you have done this, 
You will never leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. Now that takes guts for somebody to talk to a king like that. But he said, look, man, what you have done is not cool, and I'm not standing for it, and I'm going to speak out against it. And that's exactly what he did. John recognized the hypocrisy of the religious leaders who had corrupted the original intent of the Lord's commands. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, Jesus calls them the same thing too, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. John calls these dudes out. He says, you Sadducees and Pharisees, you religious leaders, you're a brood of vipers. Why? Because they were they weren't living by faith. They were living by rules. They were living by the law. And that was never the intent of God's law. The law was meant to be lived by through faith. The fifth thing, they both preached against the behavior of evil kings. Elijah and John, they had courageous attitudes. They gave them an authoritative voice to speak against the sin of even a king. Elijah confronted Ahab, and John went against the actions of Herod Antipas. Now, Herod Antipas, if you remember, he was the son of Herod the Great. He only lasted in power a few years. 1 Kings, John, uh, 1 Kings 18, 18 says this, I have, not made, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your family's family, or your father's family, have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. So Elijah speaks out and he says, man, it's you and your father's family. You're the ones who have caused this catastrophe in the nation of Israel that was going to cause Israel to be swept away by the Babylonian army. Matthew chapter 14, verses 3 and 4, it says, Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Herod decided that he was going to take his brother Philip's wife Herodias and make that his queen. Right? For John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. John says, you can't do this. You can't have this woman. She doesn't belong to you. She belongs to your brother. But Herod's like, I don't care. I'm the king. I'll do what I want to do. John says, no, you can't do this, man. It's not right. This is going to cost John his life. Number six, they both had their lives sought by wicked queens. Elijah, he has this showdown with 450 prophets of Baal, calls them out. You call out to your God, I'll call out to my God. We talked about this last week. He wins. All 450 of them get smoked. Boom, gone, right? Listen, Elijah's defeat of the prophets of Baal should have been a great victory for the nation of Israel, the king and the queen should have celebrated, but instead it enraged Jezebel so much she wanted him dead. Rather than her seeing that this was the hand of God, that this victory was through the Lord Almighty, she defended these pagan gods. First Kings chapter 19, verse 2, it says, So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow, I don't make your life like one of them. She said, you're going to be just like those dudes up there that just got smoked, man. You're going to be gone. You're going to be gone. She came after the man of God. Herodias had so much contempt for John that she convinced Herod to pronounce a death sentence on him. If you remember... Herod asked for Herodias' daughter to dance in front of him. And so she dances. And the king makes this announcement. I will not withhold anything from you in the kingdom. Just tell me what you want. And the evil intent of her heart was the same evil intent as her mother's. And she goes and tells the king, I want John the Baptist's head. And so what does she do? She gets John the Baptist's head and she serves it to her mother on a platter. What a wonderful daughter she is. Number seven, 
They both suffered from depression and doubt. This is huge, church. Somehow we think that we're just supposed to be these super Christians that never deal with any type of depression or discouragement or anything else. That's what we act like. When we get into our series, um, Peace of Mind, you know, one of the things I'm going to bring up is that if you, if you have a broken arm, you go to a doctor. If you have a tooth that's not right, you go to a dentist. But if your mind is not right, what do you do? Suck it up. Suck it up. That's, 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 that's unbiblical. David was one of the most discouraged and depressed dudes I've ever seen. Read the Psalms. These guys were anointed prophets, but they were still human. We're human, church. We're human. Elijah's emotions exhausted him after his supernatural exploits when he killed the prophets of Baal. Upon hearing Jezebel's words, he flees in despair and discouragement. He's discouraged. He's like, man, this woman's going to kill me. I'm thinking, dude, you just called fire out of heaven and smoked 450 dudes. You're going to let this chick get at you? I just blows my mind. But it was the fact that's where he was at. First Kings chapter 19, verse 4 says, He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. Wow. Talk about depressed. He says, I have had enough, Lord. Ooh, I've said those words. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. He was like done. He felt like there was nothing left for him, that his life was over. God was going to show him it wasn't. But man, he was depressed. He was depressed and in despair. Likewise with John. Likewise with John. John is arrested by Herod. Months and months in prison. John's soul was in anguish. And he was attacked with doubt about who Jesus was. We talked about this a few months back. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 says, When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? He had doubt. Why? He's in prison. He's thinking the Messiah is coming. He's going to liberate all of us. John was no different. Nobody understood the cross. Nobody did. Until Jesus died. And resurrected. And then it became clear what Jesus had been saying. But John was no different. John's like, really? I'm in prison, man. Where are you? They both dealt with this emotional state. Church, we need to have more empathy and love for our brothers and sisters who become discouraged or in despair, man. Right? Because this, this, this uh, what, is, what do they say? Suck it up, buttercup, or something like that? Or I don't know what the saying is. Something like that, man. Listen, man, that's not, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. Paul says just the opposite. When we're broken and we're in pieces, we're supposed to come alongside of each other and encourage each other and build each other up, church. Man, there's a lot of things we got to do differently. So why these seven similarities? Why am I showing you these things, right? Because it's important to understand that Elijah... And John the Baptist, right, they're from the same cloth. And that what Elijah experienced, John the Baptist experienced. And so John the Baptist, in a sense, is doing a redo also. Lakayim, right, that Hebrew word. In fact, if there was any doubt that John the Baptist was who he said he was, that he was as, as Elijah, Jesus himself proclaims John the Baptist as Elijah. Out of Jesus' own mouth, he says, this is him. So if there was any doubt with anybody, Jesus sets them straight. If you go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 7, it reads, As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Now, if you remember, John sends his disciples and asks Jesus, 
Are you the one? John needs to know. And Jesus says, just look at what I've done, dude. It's me, right? So after these, the, his disciples leave, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. He says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? little humor there. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? Well, we know John wasn't in fine clothes. He says, no, those who wear fine clothes are in the king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. That comes out of Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Truly I tell you, among the, those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. We will get into what that means in about eight weeks, right? We'll break this down because we're about eight weeks out from this, this passage of Scripture. And we'll explain it, and it's going to blow your mind, okay? It's going to be not what we've been taught. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, now Jesus is putting it out there, if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He says, look, man, if it's up to you to accept the truth, but I'm telling you it's him. So John and Jesus are the redos. John is a redo of Elijah. Jesus is a redo of the nation of Israel. Right? You catching this now? So now these two are going to have a public encounter. Right? The first time they saw each other, it was, well, they didn't see each other. They were babies, right? But now they're going to have this public encounter. And now we're going to talk about the baptism of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. That's where we're going to start. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to Lachaim, fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At, the moment heaven, at that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus comes to the Jordan River to be baptized. In the Gospel of John, John, the writer of the gospel, says that when John the Baptist saw him, he said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He called him out. This is him. This is the one, the one who's going to take away the sins of the world. This is the Lamb, the purest Lamb that you could ever find. He's the one. This is him. Jesus shows up, and John begins to resist him. He says, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? But Jesus says something interesting. Jesus says, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So what righteousness are they fulfilling? Again, that word, la kayem, the Hebrew word to perform, to uphold, to do, that word is in play here. So what is it that John is redoing with Jesus? Well, here you go. This is why Jesus was baptized. Right after Jesus is baptized, he begins his earthly ministry. Jesus is baptized, and the first thing that happens is he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days to fast, to prepare himself, because his ministry was starting. The devil comes and tempts him. We'll get into that as we get later in the study. 
But this temptation is the first step in Jesus' ministry. Well, here's something key we need to grasp. The book of Hebrews tells us something interesting about Jesus. If you go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it reads, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us firmly hold to the faith we, present, we profess. Listen, Jesus is a priest. He's a priest. So as a priest, Jesus had to be prepared. What do you mean prepared, pastor? Well, here's what I mean. The Jewish laws which had been passed down orally from generation to generation. Remember I told you there was the written Torah and then there was the oral Torah, right? They had several things to say about the need for ritual washing, ceremonial washing, and the most desirable places to do it. Now, there were six places that were considered Places that you could do ritual washing or ceremonial washing. Pits and cisterns were the lowest. Like that was the, if that's all you had, it was okay. They were the worst. But the best, now check this out, were called living waters. And they were lakes and flowing rivers. Interesting that Jesus is called the living water. And he's immersed into what's called a living water. Now, here's something, a little side note for you to catch. The Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah is the oral Torah where they wrote it down. They call it the Mishnah. So that the things that were orally said, instead of them being transferred down orally, generation to generation, they put it into writing, they put it into a book. Now, the Mishnah specifies what makes the water clean or unclean. And it expresses a preference for a larger, fresher body of water. For in it, persons may immerse themselves and immerse others. That's baptism. So John immersing people in the living waters of the River Jordan was perfectly in line with Jewish tradition and Jewish thought. So is baptism in Jewish scripture? Yes, it is. It's in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 through 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. Well, how did they wash their hands and their feet? This is a metaphor. They got in the basin. The basin was huge. If you ever see these basins, they're amazing. They're unbelievable. So the priests had to be ritually clean in order to serve in the tabernacle. Right? Are you with me? You catching this? You, you kind of getting the pieces to come together a little bit? Here's the other side of things. In Leviticus chapter 15, the Israelite people who had become unclean for whatever reason had to bathe their whole body in fresh water in order to be clean. Again, a type of baptism. Later, when the temple had been finally built by Solomon, before any person was allowed to go into the temple, it was necessary for every one of them to be immersed in the the, the mikvah or the basin, right? To become ritually clean before entering the temple. Now, if you ever see these basins, when in 1967, after the war there, and the Israelites got back to the city of Jerusalem, they began to excavate the city, and they began to pull away the layers of rock and everything else, and they started to find these huge mikvah, these basins that were used for water, and they saw something interesting. They saw steps 
on the left side that walked down in that went down into the water. These these were called the impure steps, the tamai, right? They were called the tamai. So they would step down into the water. They would immerse themselves. They would cleanse themselves. They would cl- they would they would wash themselves. And then on the other side, they had the steps that would come out. And those steps were called the clean steps or the tahor. So you had the tamay as you went in, the tahor as you came out. So Jesus' baptism, church, right? It's a redo. It's a redo of the priestly washing that was required to perform their duties as a priest. Jesus was getting ready to perform the duties of a priest. Remember, one of the first things that he did is he walks into a synagogue. He pulls out the scroll that was being read that day, and he reads from Isaiah Isaiah 61, and he basically says, this is me. He could have never done that unless he was a priest. The washing or baptism also identified Jesus with the people. Right. Remember, Leviticus 15 said that if you were unclean for any reason, that you would have to wash your whole body in this these basins so that you would be clean. And so what we see here is Jesus's baptism plays out to two things. It plays out to his priestly side. And it plays out to his humanity side. Jesus was a priest who needed to be cleansed and ready for his ministry. But he was also identifying with the people, who the common people, when they would become unclean for whatever reason it was, would ceremonially wash their bodies in these huge basins so that they could become clean. And so when Jesus arrives at the Jordan River, it's for this purpose to identify who he was and who he was there for, priest and the people. And out of those people, Jewish tradition holds that a few disciples happened to see him and recognize him. And those are the first ones that were called when he sees them by the seashore. So, That's what I have for you tonight. Next week, we're going to talk about this descending dove. What's the significance of this? Why why this? Why do we see this? Who saw it? That's the key. So any questions? Yes, ma'am. Verse 10. Did I cover verse 10? Okay, let me go. I did jump it. Okay, so verse 10. Let me pull up my Bible here. And let me see. Let's go to... Okay. All right, so let me go and see. And you said it was verse 10, right? Okay, so the, the question is revolving around verse, verse 10 of Matthew 3. Um, let me open this up, and I'll read it so people can hear it. <clears throat> the axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So... Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, okay? Or I should say that John the Baptist is. He calls them these brood of vipers, and he warns them about this coming wrath. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as as a father. He says, I tell you that out out of these stones, God can raise up children from Abraham. He's basically letting them know that If they continue to do what they're doing, which was relying on 
what Abraham had to say, their father Abraham, relying on these uh, religious acts rather than faith with God, he's basically saying, look, we're going to remove you. God's going to remove you. You're going to be out of here. And that's what exactly happened. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they didn't last any, any longer than another 100 years, and they were gone. John tells them, look, you're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. In other words, you're going to be cut down and you're going, to be, you're, going to be, you're going to be gone. So fire is a type of cleansing. Fire is always identified with uh, power and cleansing. Fire, fire, when a fire happens, it, it burns everything. It takes away all the, the, the nasty stuff, and, and, and it burns everything away, and then stuff can grow again. We're not talking about salvation here. We're not talking about anything else. We're talking about a mindset that the Sadducees and Pharisees had. This is directed at them. It's not directed at anybody else. So no, you're not going to be cut down and thrown away, my sister. You're good. Okay, so he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. Okay. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. His call was repent for the kingdom of heaven is, is near. So your question regarding that is the water repentance or do you have to have water to be repentant or? Yes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Remember what happened in Acts chapter 2. It's Jesus who gives us the Holy Spirit. That's who gives us the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ into our hearts, the Holy Spirit comes and seals us. If you remember in Acts chapter 2, that is when the disciples were waiting on the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, what happened? There was like fire on top of their head, right? It said it looked like flames. So, yes, this Holy Spirit and fire, it's a good thing. The fire, again, remember what I said, power, cleansing, this is power, Holy Spirit and power. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I actually wasn't even going to take what I took tonight. I was just going to focus on the baptism part because everything else is kind of explanatory, but maybe it wasn't explanatory. So, But we explained it, I think, yeah. where I think we're okay. <laughs> Anything else? So there, there, were, there were prophetic things that were spoken in the Old Testament. It was prophesied by Isaiah that Babylon was going to come and take uh, Judah and that the Assyrians were going to take the ten northern tribes, the, 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 what was considered Israel at that time. So yes, those things were there. As far as, but as far as Jesus is concerned, and this is what we're focusing on, as far as Jesus is concerned, anything that prophetically happened with the nation of Israel, Jesus, we're going to see, is going to redo it. So in the instances that we have brought up Regarding the Lord, yes, those were prophetic things that have happened, but Jesus is not Jesus is not fulfilling those things in the sense we're trying to say that he is. He's he's already he's fulfilling the actions of the people that have already been played out. Like what I shared with you about a son is is born out of Isaiah. Remember that? And then I shared with you that that would actually happen, that there was a priestess that that. An, an, uh, a priestess of Israel that was a virgin that gave birth to this child. So this child was assigned to, to the king at that time that the two warring countries that were coming against them, Edom and whoever else it was, I can't remember now, that this was going to be a sign that they were going to be no more. And that's what exactly happened when this child was born. This child, it said in, in the prophecy, it said that this child, before it knew right and wrong, that these kings were going to be no more and they were gone. Why? Because the Assyrians came in and swept them away. 
So when Jesus is, is born, right, this sign that was given to this king, and Jesus is now that same sign, but he's redoing the same thing that happened in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 6 or whatever, or verse 9, verse, verse, chapter 9, verse 6. So what I, I always tell you guys this, it's, it's the Western church and the last 800 years who have made prophecy this thing where everything's in the future. But as far as, the, as far as Jewish thought and the way the Bible was written, it's already happened. It's happened. Joel's happened. Joel chapter 2 has happened. The Holy Spirit's been poured out. It's poured out at Pentecost, right? But you have to understand that that same event happened with the prophets who, jo who Joel was talking about. It, it happened once. So you can look at it any way you want to look at it, right? I know that we're taught one way to look at prophecy. I'm trying to show you another way to look at prophecy. How you look at it, I don't care. It's up to you, right? I'm going to share the information with you. The information doesn't change, right? But I think when you understand why Jesus was being baptized, I think that's huge. Because we never knew why he was being baptized. Anybody here know why he's being baptized? I don't think anybody knew. We just took it as he's being baptized. That's why he was baptized, because he was a priest, and he was for the people. So he had a duty to be baptized as a priest, but he, he did it out of love and obligation for the people. So, great question. Anything else? Great. Lord, thank you for tonight. Bless the rest of our evening, the rest of our week, and we thank you for your love and grace. In Jesus' name, and all the church prayed.